right, so last week was the first Sunday of the new year. And last week, I started this sermon entitled, A Call to Persevere. Basically, what I'm sharing started last week, and I probably hope to finish today, will be what the vision of the firehouse has been and always will be. And there's one thing that I can tell you, that the vision of the firehouse chapel has never changed, and it never will. In fact, because I know something. I said last week, I don't know what, when things are going to happen, how things are going to happen, but I do know something, and I'm so happy I know something. I know exactly what God called us to do. So with that, I am content. With that, I'm happy. But I want to share that. I need to, I need to help you all understand more of what the firehouse is all about so that we as a body can be more effective in doing what God has called us to do. So the title of the sermon last week was A Call to Persevere. It is basically two things. Know this. Number one, there is a call. Number two, the question begs, will you, will I, will we answer the call? I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Jude. The book of Jude, verse number 17. There is only one chapter in the book of Jude. So if you're asked, looking, just turn to the book of Jude. It's right next to Revelation. So if you don't flip to the end, back up to the left. And it's right there. The book of Jude. I'm going to begin reading at verse number 17. And then we will get right into what the scripture is about. But dear friends, remember what the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last days, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. There are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not, do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Verse number 22. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire to show others Mercy mixed with fear, hating, despising, being repulsed by, even the clothes stained by corrupted flesh. Lord, bless this word, and we ask God you open our eyes, and our hearts, and our ears, and our spirit to what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Last week, we went over verses 17 through 19, where it says to be alert and to be discerning. Because many will come who will try to sidetrack you. In your faith, in your walk with God, there's always new fads that come in and out of Christianity. Somebody writes a book, and I don't believe that their intention is always for people to jump on it like a new fad. But people do anyway because of human nature, especially human nature that is not founded in the word of God. They have a tendency to just go that direction and go this way. So there will be many different things that will come along through Christianity. But it says to be alert and be prepared so that you know what is what. Then we looked at verse 20 through 21. And it says to be built up in your faith. I said this last week. Let me remind you of it this week. No one can build your faith except you. No church is ever designed to build your faith. Because you cannot build somebody's faith unless they want to. It just, it just can't happen. You can tell people. You can show people. You can instruct people. You can do diagrams and whiteboards and chalkboards and flannel boards. You can do all those different things. But guess what? Not a single person is going to grow in their faith unless they want to. It's just not going to happen. In fact, I think there's a scripture that says, talking about casting your pearl in front of swine. Basically, what that means is, you can do the greatest presentation, you can do the greatest delivery, you can spell it out so plain and clear for people, but if they don't want to hear it, if they don't want to grow, they're not going to. So it says right here, to build up yourselves in your most holy faith. And now here we pick up in 22 and 23, which is the heartbeat of the Firehouse Chapel. 
as well as it should be for me, and it is for you, and it is for this body. Let me say this, and I know I have somewhere in my notes, but I, don't, I can't remember. Let me say this to you. When I'm talking about this today, I want you to keep something in mind. Uh, what I want you to keep in your mind is I ain't just talking about this church. I'm talking about yins that are sitting in those chairs, me standing up here. I want you all to think about it and to understand that it is a responsibility that every single person who calls themselves a Christian, a believer, according to Scripture, has. But I can say that for the Firehouse Chapel, for this body, this is the mainstay of who we are. First thing it says, to have mercy on those who are wavering. Have mercy on those who are wavering. The odds are that there is, and I'm going to take this stretch. The odds are there's not a single person in this room that in somewhere along their line, their faith has not wavered. I mean, my wife just proclaimed it herself at her very young age. I was waiting for you to toss out the actual age. At my age, I'm like, yes, what might that be? I still don't know. But I, 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 let me, I, I, I really believe that there's not a single one of us that somewhere hasn't doubted. And the thing is, I believe that this is a process of personal choice and desire whether or not you want to understand and you want to grow and you don't want to doubt. Now, if you want to know more, you will know more about your faith. If you don't, you won't. With that said, I believe this. It says to have mercy on those uh, who doubt. As you grow in Christ, your maturity level grows in Christ. Therefore, what has to happen, you should be able to show mercy as you grow in Christ. I always find this interesting. And, and I've said this before, and please don't. And if I miscommunicate it, I'll try to explain myself after it's brought to my attention. I didn't grow up in church. Thank God. Because I don't carry into my Christianity a lot of stuff. But it's always interesting to me that the longer people are Christians, they forget about where they once were. But what's frightening is some people never think that they were somewhere else. That somehow when they got squirted out of the chute, that they were this little angel of God. And that sin never affected their life, that they never had, that they were like birthed into it. And they forget what it means to be a sinner saved by grace. And when that occurs... I always notice something, and this is an observation. I've been a Christian 42 or 3 years. I'm 60 years old. Jesus Christ radically saved my life. And I can tell you that I made an observation in 30-some years, 36 years of ministry, that the people that show less mercy to, to, to people who are struggling are people who never thought they needed it. Because they've never needed it. I mean, I know I was a filthy, disgusting sinner. And a bunch of you know that you were a filthy, disgusting sinner. So we go, yeah, I, I need that one. Oh, baby. Boy, bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it. But then there's others who sit and they go, no, I, no, I'm, I, I, I went to church. I went to Sunday school. I went to Bible studies. I went to I, I did this, and I did that, and I did all these things. But the fact is, you don't show mercy to those who doubt. I heard uh, a, a long time ago a preacher said, Christianity is the only religion that shoots its wounded. You get what that means? Some of you get what that means. What that means is when somebody's struggling, that they have no mercy for them. Like, kill them all and let God sort them out. And it's proclaimed that we are to show mercy to those who doubt. 
I said last week, life is messy. Church is messy. You got messy people that come in here. You ought to see this place when you leave. Glasses are left, coats. How do some of you leave without your coats when it's eight degrees outside? I don't know. And the fun. So here's the classic. Oh, I love this. Giorgio's calls me and says, uh, Pastor Steve, there's a Bible left here. Really? And nobody notices it's missing. In other words, whoever left it here hasn't noticed their Bible missing for a week or two weeks. And then they happen to come to me and say, I think I left my Bible here last week. And I get to say, that was a month and a half ago. <laughs> because it's in, been sitting in my truck waiting for you to show up or ask for it. Then it's like, oh, man. Well, I have, I have another one. Oh, good, like your spare. You have your spare. That is true. I threw that out there. Now, I understand something about this doubting something. That's not giving a free pass to allow sin and rebellion to be in a person's life. Christianity causes us to grow. We must grow. Scripture even says that there are some people that have to be given over to Satan. There are some people that just refuse to accept Christ and accept instruction, and they are to be given over to Satan. In other words, be gone. But the fact is, we are to have mercy on those who doubt. This being a rescue station, there are going to be people that come in here and doubt. There are going to be people that come in here with confusion and misunderstandings and past hurts and pains, and they're going to be trying to figure something out. We have to be a body and we have to be individual believers that have enough growth and maturity in our lives that we allow for that, for instruction to come, grace to be shown, so that people will know that they're loved. Now, the next part. It says, says to save others by snatching them out of the fire. Now here's a note I wrote. We meaning me and you, cannot save anyone. But what we can be is the hands and feet and knees, knees, K-N-E-E-S, the knees of Christ. I can't save a single one of you. You can't save a single person. But we go to the one who can. But it says here, there's an instruction given here that is very important for all of us. It says that we are to snatch others from the fire. I find this interesting. Some of you don't know the history of the Firehouse Chapel. You don't know why we're called the Firehouse Chapel. We are, well, no, not true. Somebody stole our name in Minnesota. Somebody, there's now another Firehouse Chapel. Yes. Yes, in Minnesota. I think we need to go take a little road trip. See, <laughs> that was our name. Give it back. But I know when I call that we have, we have to carry insurance from the church. It's through Church Mutual. When I call, now this is a nationwide company. When I say, hi, it's Pastor Steve from the Firehouse Chapel. Do you need my account number? This is what they say. No. You're the only one. But people don't even know why we call it Firehouse Chapel. And I'll explain it to you real quickly. On September 22, 2002, when we started this church under my school ministry called Teen Reach, because God, after 40 days of fasting and praying, my wife and I felt impressed to start another work. God was calling us to start a church. And we kept saying, Lord, there's plenty of great churches here. Why do we have to start a church? Why do you want to start a church? Why can't we go somewhere else? Why can't I just do more speaking in the schools? And that'll be fine. And God constantly, and we didn't talk about it for 40 days, did we not? 40 days, we promised that we wouldn't talk about what God was saying until we got together at the end of 40 days of fasting and praying. We sat down, and I looked at her, and I said, I, this is totally insane, but I think God is calling us to start a church. And she looked at me, she goes, I agree 100%. So after 40 days of fasting and praying, we know that God called us. We sat our kids down and said, hey, God's calling us to start a church. We're not going to start unless you are with us. They went and prayed, came back, said, we're all in. But we didn't have a name. So we started under Teen Reach 2. Some of you remember. Or we affectionately called it the church with no name. Until the middle of February of 2003 when a, a nightclub caught on fire on the East Coast after a pyrotechnic thing went bad. And people were trapped inside of that burning 
nightclub and they burned to death on live TV. And as I stood there that morning and I watched that happen, happen, and I watched the, the death and destruction and the fear, I came up with the name of the Firehouse Chapel, and here's why. Because as the cameras were rolling and people were jammed, remember, people were jammed in the doorways and the windows. They couldn't get out because they were stuck. The, the flames were coming out and the smoke was overtaken. People were dying from suffocation. There were people that were running away from the fire, getting as far away as they could. There was others standing on a hill in the parking lot, looking down but not going near. And then there was others that were running right up to that fire, trying to reach in and grab people and pull them through the windows and pull them through the doors. As fire and smoke came out, it didn't matter. They were there, and I stood there, and I said to my wife, we will be called the firehouse because we are not going to be the people that run. We are not going to be the people that stand. We're going to be the people that run right to the fire, grab those people, drag them out. And we will be a rescue station one foot from the gate of hell. There is no turning back. And there will never be a turning back. Because that's what the firehouse is. Now let me explain this to you. You're here. Some of you have been snatched from the fire through this work. But if you call yourself a Christian... You are to snatch others from a fire. You hear me? Or as the kids say, you feel me? <laughs> Just seems weird when I say that. Doesn't it? <laughs> this term here in the scripture where it says save others by snatching them. It's an interesting term. People just read right by it. There's a lot to that term. In fact, if you go to the Greek, you discover what that term really means. Snatching means this. It refers back to a wild beast that has got a hold of a prey and has clamped its jaws or its arms around it and will not let it go. It has totally and absolutely grabbed a hold of it. And there is no, nothing that is going to release it. It is a term that is referred to taken by force. It's not a little two-finger crack. Crackers, come here. Come on, Graham. They're like, why do you call him Crackers? His first name's Graham. <laughs> Look at me. No, yeah. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. This could be interesting. It's all for missions. Yeah. All right. We're going to take an offering. <laughs> Those of you that want to see death and destruction, 10 bucks each. All right. <laughs> Do I hear 200? It's all going to Nana's house. Do it for missions. Yeah. It's not a little two finger grab where he, if he backed up, he would pull out. That, that's not snatching anything. It is an all out, and I won't do it. You can if you want to. No. For example. You see who's sitting there? Yeah. I can't. Now if she wasn't there. <laughs> we could dub this right out of the video. Yeah. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> it means you have snatched somebody and there is no way that you are going to let them go because you have a grip on them and you are not going to let them go I'm going to give you a new sweater <laughs> give you a new sweater oh, that's my little crackers why are you doing that It's a powerful term. It means you reach in and you take a hold of it with everything inside of you. Do you understand how powerful that is? Now let me, let me, let me say this. John 10, 28, Jesus says, And I give them eternal life. They will never perish and no one will ever snatch them 
out of my hand. Jesus Christ gets a grip on our lives. But yet here in Jude, we're told to snatch others from the fire. We are called to do this. We are called to snatch them from the fire, but you got to understand something. Anything and anyone in that fire will be destroyed. And anyone who reaches into that fire, if they are not prepared, will also be destroyed. Therefore, we must be prepared as a body and as individuals to reach into the fire and to pull one out as snatching a stick from the fire. Our grip on the lost must be as intense as a wild beast holding on to prey. It has to be that intense. People want to know what drives me. That's what drives me. If people want to know what drives this church, it's the fact that we have yet to fill that empty chair. We have yet to fill it with the person or persons in your life that you are praying for, that you are waiting before God for to fill that chair. The reason we got to be intense, man, is because people's lives depend on it. I have told you before, I was a lifeguard for many years. I saved people. I rescued people. When I would go into whatever kind of situation, I better not go in just with a two-finger grab because they're going down for their last breath. I better go in with all the force that I can and get a hold of as much as I can and drag them to safety. Because if I didn't, they're dead. The scripture puts us dead to rights. That we, this is not something we can ignore. It is something that we are called to do. You know what? I don't, it's not even my, you know what? It's, church is jacked up, man. It really, it really is. Modern day church is so stinking jacked up. You know why? I'm going to tell you why. Because it's all about this. It's all about us. It's all about getting in and getting safe. It's all about us peeing in every corner to mark our territory so no one else comes in because it's ours. And granted, you know, I may not be the greatest theologian to walk the face of the earth. But I do understand scripture. Nowhere in the New Testament did they ever build a building. You know what they did, in fact? The apostles looked at the body and said, sell everything you have, bring it together, and we will take care of each other's needs. If you can tell me of a church that does that, I can tell you of a church that's pretty close to it. When you all, when there's a need, you guys rise right to the occasion, man. When there's a call... You guys rise to the occasion. You put yourselves second. And you put others first. That's what a church is. That's what a body is. All that other trash is just that. It's man-made, put together, make me feel good stuff. Church, I said this from the very first Sunday... Church will never be for us to go here. It'll never be for us. It's always for that next one coming in. It's always for the next one. We ain't going to circle the wagons. We ain't going to do things the way it's a, so many think it's going to happen. We're going to snatch people from the fire. Here, real quick. How do you apply this to your life? First, this intensity. 
First, you apply it to your prayer life. Think of that person or persons in your life that no matter how many church services they would go to, no matter how many times you would sit and share scripture with them, no matter what, they ain't budging. You got that person or persons in your mind? Okay. You know what will change them? When you storm heaven. When you go at it with everything inside of you. Instead of walking into prayer like, prayer. You go in realizing that this is an opportunity for me to begin to be part of saving someone's life. See, to me, it's so simple. What drives, what drives her, what drives this church is saving people. Not caring about whatever. You know what's so cool? You, some of you don't even know this. Do you know that all this just doesn't magically show up in the morning? Do any of you know that? When we come in here, the chairs are set up, but Ray is putting them all together. And he's praying over every one of them, I think. You, Oh, you forgot to. That's all right, right? Don't worry about it. But all this just doesn't magically show up. You know what's interesting about the guys that show up for setup, which is the band, myself, some others that come? Scott snags the trailer, I snag the trailer. You know what's cool about it? We never complain about it. I, we, we make fun of each other, we talk about medical conditions. We make fun of things, but no matter if it's 90, 100 degrees, or 10 below. You know what I appreciate about the people that do that? They know all their efforts are going to go to save a person's life. And then afterwards, the yens were all just gone. Somebody's got to load that trailer. Somebody's got to wind all this all stuff, haul this all back, carry it, get. See, we had to buy a short trailer to get it in a short garage, short height. How many of us guys have been in there and had concussions? <laughs> Look at the hands. Look at, the, yeah, see, Jake, Jake, when he was little, should have been in the trailer. Now it's just like we don't even ask him to go in there. Because <laughs> the poor kid's on his knees and he's still dinging his head on the inside of the trailer. How many of us have lost hair? To, that, to, to the trailer. How about, it? there's a corner, there's an edge, man. It's just, when you bleed and it pulls your hair. Johnny's, Johnny, Johnny's not. Johnny had a full-fledged concussion because he hit his head so hard. And you would think after so many years, we'd learn the trailer's short. But you know why they pack it all up? It's because to save one person's life. You know why those Sunday school teachers do what they do? To save one person's life. You know why the ushers do what they do? To save one person's life. You know why the sound people do what they do? To save one person's life. So you apply this to your prayer life. You apply it to your service. I'm available. Are you available for the firehouse chapel? Oh, yeah, I'm available. Are you? Are you available? If you get a call, are you available? You got to ask yourself that question. And I want to challenge it. Yeah, we have a leadership thing. Yeah, we ask, we look to people, but we also have volunteers that don't sign a leadership form. But if you're a leader, are you willing? Are you willing? If you're a volunteer, are you willing? Are you willing to serve? Or are you always wanting to be served? I know people have complained about us setting up and tearing down. And God is my witness, never once in the 15 years that I've been setting up or tearing down, have they ever touched a cord, a speaker, or anything? I'm like, get away from me. You apply it to your giving. Oh, I knew he was going to get that in there somehow. Hey, let me be honest with you. We believe in tithing. Minimum of 10% of your gross income goes to the Lord. I don't have a problem with saying that. Her and I do way above 10%. And I didn't write it, so if you got a problem with it, take it up with God. See, that's the fun part about being a pastor. I didn't say it. He said it. But are you robbing God? Are you paying for your kid's sporting event instead of paying God back his tithe? Oh, I'm sending my kids to Christian schools, so that's my tithe. No, that's paying for your kid's Christian education. It has nothing to do with your tithe. Tithe is the first fruits that you bring before the Lord. You get paid? Here, Lord, here's my fruit. Here's my first fruit. Not after I pay all my bills. No, Lord, here is it first. That's your tithe. 
That is giving. That is properly giving. And you do, see, here's the thing. Like I said last week, if you weren't here, $149,029 last year from the Firehouse Chapel went through and out of this church to missions. $149,029 left this church to go out and to reach people for Jesus Christ. So your giving also does affect. You apply it to your spiritual growth. Just because you got in a lifeboat doesn't mean you should just be content. Start rowing. You know what I'm saying? You still can burn to death in the hot sun if you're sitting in a rowboat out in the middle of the ocean. Start rowing. Start growing. Yeah, I just want to be safe. No, 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 no. That's not enough. It's not enough. Because the more you grow, the more you're prepared. The more you're prepared, the more ready you are to run right up to that fire and to grab that one from the fire and hang on for all you're worth. Why? Because you're prepared. You're ready. You're like, I'm going to grow and I'm going to do this. Uh, I got to hurry. We want to equip you. We want to equip you to the best of your ability to reach people. Folks, you need to get your butt here on, church, on time for church. I told the ushers, we're not adding any more chairs. We're going to usher people in. You want the good seats, you get here early. We're not going to move people in from the sides. We had a big debate about this. I got to hurry. We had a big debate about this. Like, what if somebody comes in there sitting on the end, and a family of five comes in, and we looked at the person sitting on the end and said, would you move in? If it was me, I'd say no. I got here early. I like sitting on the end. Right, Karen? I, I like sitting on the end. We, we don't like sitting. She's like when she waves her hands. Like, you got you to be careful. When she praises. Notice no one's sitting on either side of you because you get a little, you get a little like, whoa. You just give her space. She's worshiping. Duck. Okay. Karen and I were like, well, my one arm doesn't go up, so you're safe. And yeah, we're good. So. The fact is, I was like, I'm not moving in. I came early. So here's, here's a concept. Because I know you get your kids to hockey practice on time. I know you get your kids to piano lessons on time. I know you get your kids to school on time. I know you get to the movie on time. I know all this happens. But yet somehow, church, it's so hard to get on time. It's pastor's services at night. There. Cher and I had a discussion. She goes, Steve, would you consider moving service at 10 o'clock? Absolutely not. <laughs> she goes, are we going to talk about it? I go, absolutely not. No. No. 9.30, I like 9.30. I pr would prefer 8.30. Right. But the fact is, we got children. Oh, only on Sunday? What do you, rent them out the rest of the week? And then, oh, we got to, are we missing something? Let's go find the kids. Where's the kids? And you bring them from wherever, and they're like, here we are. We Folks. It's about rescuing people. And worship, let me hear, let, real quick, I'm gonna, worship builds you up. It's just not the words, it's the worship builds you up to. So get it in here. That's the vision of the Firehouse Chapel. We are called to persevere. Look, before I pray, you are called to persevere. We, usins, are called to persevere. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. And God, equip us. I know you have. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. I know you will. Do whatever it takes. And God, I know that means us opening our lives to you. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would touch every person that is here this morning, and that, God, that they would be open to you. At first, Lord, I pray for those in this room that don't know you, that they're lost, they're empty. They are filled with sin or the world. They're unrepentant. I pray today, God, is the day of their salvation, that today is the day, Lord, that they reach up and take hold of your arm and accept you into their life. With your heads bowed for just a moment, we do this every week. I ask this one simple question. If there's anybody here this morning that wants to pray to accept Christ in their life, 
I want to pray for you. How we do it is I'm going to stay here. You're going to stay where you're at. And if you want to pray, I'm going to ask you to look at me in just a moment. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You have to pray it from your heart. And then you're going to start walking. Starting on my right. You want to pray? Look at me right now. All I got to see is your eyes. My left. Okay. Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you for each and every one that's here today. And God, I know you're doing the amazing. You will challenge, but yet, God, you have called us to persevere. And we will, through your strength, rise to the calling. Why don't you all stand? If you would like prayer this morning, we have people here that will...